podcast. I'm Salvatore Ramones. Joining me is Peter Dietz. Peter, why don't you list out all the initials after your name so I don't have to? <laughs> all right. Now, what do you want me to actually introduce myself? Well, MD, PhD, F-R-A-N-Z-O-G. I was wondering if that one was made up. D-D-U-C-U. -U. Yeah. Well, you know, in medicine, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to... Um, to accumulate postnomials, okay? In fact, I've left some out. Uh, <laughs> you have a debilitation, I presume. Well, it's more like, you know, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a gynecologist, um, I'm a subspecialist in urogynecology, which is uh, basically pelvic floor problems. And um, what else is there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did some higher degrees. Part of them very much, um, what's the word, um, connected to the job itself, and some of them because I've always been interested in research. So I'm a clinical researcher with uh, 380 publications and an age factor of 75, which in medicine varies a lot. You know, these things vary a lot from one field to the other, but in ONG, it's pretty good. It's kind of, um, I think I'm probably, in some ways I'm top nationally in obstetrics and gynecology, but of course that, only serves to justify that I'm talking to you because really I'm an ex-professor. I feel a bit like a an imposter because I lost my job with uh, the University of Sydney uh, just a couple of months ago. I, I'm an imposter too. I'm uh, associate professor Salvatore Bonus. You are a real bona fide professor because once a professor, always a professor. You have the title really? Professor Dr. Dietz. Really, really. Uh, yes. they, wouldn't, they wouldn't even make me emeritus. They wouldn't even give me an honorary appointment after this because um, <laughs> I've been, as it were, deplatformed. So uh -huh. um, it's not permanent. It's not, it's not final. The matter is before the Industrial Relations Commission. But I'm sure you've heard from lots and lots of others who are in similar situations, whether it's in the US or in Europe or in Australia or in New Zealand. This is, um, it's the times. We live in strange times. And um, so much has changed over the last few years. Everything's, you know, the ground's shaking. Um, I can feel it. It's, it's um, and in universities, I guess it's been shaking for a while. So well, before we talk about deplatforming, let's let's talk about what we advertise. We would talk about, which is research product. Oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Now I have a Google H index. For those who don't know, H index is something produced by Google uh, that tells you how many publications a person has that have been cited that number of times. So my H index yeah. is twenty five. I have twenty five publications that have been cited yeah. at least yeah. twenty five times. Uh, Peter, yours is an extraordinary 75. Now, I know that the, uh, and I should point out to people that the difficulty of getting H indexes goes up something like exponentially. It's not quite, but it's in that realm of, uh, of difficulties. 75 is not three times as much as 25. It is extraordinarily more than yeah, 25. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're an extraordinarily well-published researcher, even well-cited, even for medicine. Now, I know standards differ by discipline, and my 25 yeah. is pretty good for the social sciences, yeah, but yeah. You know, how do you get a 75 H index? And there's actually even more to it, um, because uh, if you were to look at, you, you see, there, there, there are a number of different ways of measuring productivity. And, and in, uh, which has been a hobby of mine for a long time. I even, at some stage, some six or seven years ago, I developed my own index. Of course, it's called a D-index, <laughs> but nobody, you know, nobody noticed. Um, I still think it's a great idea, but that won't help if the rest of the world ignores it. Um, let, let's talk about productivity. Let's talk about research productivity because that's kind of not immediately political. So, um, so that hopefully we don't turn everybody off straight away. So <laughs> we wouldn't want that. Well, so it's going to turn people on, but let's wait to turn people on until we give them a little good yeah. medicine. Yeah, I mean, uh, see, productivity, Paul Krugman said, productivity is not everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything. So whether a species um, continues to reproduce, survives, um, outlasts, the, the times is um, 
exclusively due to reproductive performance, due to productivity. Okay. Um, and the same goes for any human endeavor. Productivity is central to everything. And for the last 10 or 12 or 14 years, I felt that um, we are not measuring productivity properly. Like um, in, in business, of course, you produce so many cars and you make so much money and your after tax profit is so and so much. And then you, you give out a dividend to your shareholders, which is so and so much. That's, these are all reasonable measures of productivity but they tend to be distorted in our, in, in our modern societies, um, even business productivity is badly distorted. So for example, um, you, you may remember Toyota manufactured cars in South Australia until a few years back. Mm -hmm. And for the last few years, they were able to do that because they got lots of money from government, from the South Australian government and from the federal government. So for them, the amount of money that they could pull in from the state became a key performance indicator, which is kind of crazy because the standard definition of productivity is output per units of input per unit of input. So the, um, and it's the same in research. So, so you're deemed to be productive if you pull in a lot of grant money, but that's an input. It's not an output. So the fundamental problem with, regulatory and state interference in what we do, what anybody does, is that the input-output relationship, that is the definition of productivity, often is distorted. Um, and uh, and when, I, when I look, when I try to establish an, an index, this D index, I try to look at proper measures of input and output. So, okay, on the one hand, there is your output, which is abstract publications, the number of citations in the peer reviewed literature, your impact factor, your age index, higher degree completion. So, I mean, how many PhDs or MDs or master students have you sponsored and, and gotten to completion? And there's public recognition. So, I mean, this is getting really, really bad now with social media impact with, you know, how many likes on Twitter, that kind of thing. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's complete garbage. That's just garbage. But, but universities take grant success very, very seriously. And that's annoyed me no end for quite a while because I've, I, I need to make this anonymous. So uh, I once visited a very senior academic providing a lecture on research productivity or on research in general, how to do, how to measure your own productivity and uh, he went on bragging about the $5 million in ARC grants that he had pulled in over a few years. And, and then he also, of course, he, he, he presented some slides on his impact factor, his the impact factors of the journals that he su submits to the, his citations over time, that kind of thing. Um, and then I realized that, um, I mean, this guy was supposed to be the big horn show. And I realized that on some measures, the work that I did with my pathetic little unit with virtually no funding um, and no support from anybody, I mean, anything, what I was ever able to hope for was benign neglect. And I've been saying that for 10 years. Benign neglect is just the best I could possibly hope for. And despite that, um, my unit looked an awful lot better. So I came up with this idea of using grant money, access to money properly as an input rather right. than an output. And that resulted in the D index, which showed that my unit was about, um, depending on the, on the calculations between 300 and 1000 times more productive than that guy. <laughs> so by two to three orders of magnitude, Yes. And, and when you when you when you come up with these kinds of shocking, I mean, that was conservative. That was wow. con conservative because you see, when it comes to citations, yeah, um, in particular in labs, in large labs, you end up with um, papers that have got ten or fifteen or twenty names on on on, it, on them. You know that, right. um, And right. and of course, in some instances, that is absolutely appropriate and 
deserved and and the right thing to do if if it's very much it's a, if it's a large team but if you just talk about citations well 120th of a paper is worth as much as if you do a paper yourself with no co-authors and of course that's nonsense well which so, is no longer allowed almost but uh, look new south university of new south wales estimates that it spends two hundred fifty thousand dollars per paper it gets two hundred two hundred fifty thousand dollars per paper it gets four or five papers Per hundred per million dollars of research funding, and I thought, give me two hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> I could give you yeah. a half yeah. dozen yeah. papers. With yeah, like yeah, yeah. I've, uh, that's that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, I've yeah. I've done done it the other way around. I've looked at citations in the peer reviewed literature uh -huh. um, over a certain period of time versus the required funding, and, and I found that the differential was we we needed thirty bucks per peer reviewed citation, and that that guy who shall remain anonymous needed 2,000 bucks. Well, you know, it's funny, by official Australian standards, I am infinitely productive according to your D index, because Because by there's no money. Because there's no money. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Well, Australia, actually, Australia. Listen, 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 I got to tell you. Yeah, yeah. I figure I came up with, because I counted the money that I myself donated into my own research account. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Australia has adopted the OECD standard, the Frascati Manual. According to the Frascati Manual, to be research, just to, to actually be called research, okay, you have to advance knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, but the activity must also be explicitly funded, uh, timed, and budgeted. You have to have time set aside and a budget for it. And because my work is, my quote-unquote research is not explicitly budgeted, it is not research. Yeah. Yet I produce, yeah, I produce yeah. two or three techs of research yeah. outputs. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I, I, I how can I, I produce I, research outputs when I don't that's do right. research? That's right. That's right. So and now I've, I mean, I've just today I, for example, to, to show what my uh, research work looks like, uh, this today or over the last couple of weeks, I looked at thousands of. Um, of imaging data sets because I'm an imaging specialist, as it were. So, so I look at lots and lots of. It's not a film these days. These are vol these are blocks of volume data, right. for for some for some measurement that I do then that I then do a few thousand times, and um, and then the stuff's got to be analyzed, which I I, I keep myself busy with today, um, and that kind of thing happens on my own time. On my own equipment, um, the data was obtained under an ethics approval, but a standard ethics approval. But it's still uh, these are my own private patients. So institutions really don't come in anywhere. And now, because in the past, one of the few things the university still provided was biostatistics. And you know, if there's anybody in the audience who said that who's felt the need to have biostat or any IT support lately with our university or my ex university, or I, I suspect any other in Australia, it's a it's a recurring nightmare and it's been getting worse and worse. It was bad in 07 and it's much worse now. So so I had to learn I had to learn SPSS and I'm still using Minitab. So all that all that stuff which normally, you know, normally the university would provide the environment in which individual insight can occur, in which research can occur that leads to insight. Peter, and it's in your own stats. You, you may not know my very first publication and it continues to be my second highest cited publication. Are you still? I was in the Journal of Pediatric and Perinatal Epidemiology. Cool. <laughs> and the reason is that I was a statistician as a graduate student. Oh, I yeah. was running statistics, uh, logistic mm -hmm. regression models, on a paper at Johns Hopkins Medical School, and I thought, "Wow, you guys are trusting a Me. graduate student <laughs> in sociology yeah, to yeah. do your biostatistics." Yeah. But do you know yeah. the grad came well, for me? And well, you see, you don't. I mean, with with modern biostatistics, you don't you don't really need the maths background. It, you know, you treat your software as a black box, right. and then it's just a matter of knowing which buttons to hit <laughs> on that black box. And and of course, normally before, I mean, at the moment, I'm I'm kind of in a bind because I don't have any access myself. I'd have to access 
uh, professional services through colleagues, um, which may soon change again, depending on my professional situation. But if not, then normally before I put something in for, uh, for publication, um, of course, I do want it vetted by a professional. It's basically like an insurance policy. Hey, if you ever want a statistical co-author for one of your mega-cited publications, just let me know. I'm available. And wow. I have a track record from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in the Brilliant. journal. <laughs> okay, but listen, like listen I, who knows, I might, be, I, might, I might be unlucky enough to have to take you up on it. <laughs> <laughs> now, now what, what the other things I mean, it, wanted to mention, the, you know, we're talking about the university, because after all, this is a professor's podcast, so we talk about the university. And and us, that's the University of Sydney. I should just uh, drop well, that. Into yeah, that. I mean, I, I, my PhD was, was with UNSW, my MD was with the University of Heidelberg. And I, in New Zealand, I had some contact with the University of Otago. So I've got a bit of an idea of what's going on out there. And of course, lots of colleagues who are in the uh, hundreds, hundreds of colleagues that are in the academic environment and rising through the ranks. I guess I, on, on principle, I, I would still say that the university is um, the archetypal institution of modern Western civilization. It's archetypal. And it provides, um, it, it is supposed to, ideally, it provides an environment that generates insight and that allows the propagation of that insight through further research, through lectures, through papers, through textbooks, through whatever. And eventually the, the idea is, I mean, the essence of the university is um, that it is an insight amplifier. And of course, on principle, your insights are or have been more likely to be widely propagated if you have the platform of the university to do it from. The problem just is that that platform is um, eroding very badly. Well, you use those magic words, modern Western civilization, and I would say that we are in a postmodern American civilization in which you know, universities have just been left behind. They are still churning out papers, but they're not necessarily churning out ideas like they used to. That's right. And a and lot of the ideas debate has moved to YouTube, it's moved to the internet, it's moved to think tanks, to private companies. I mean, are universities really where it's at? Are they where it's at in medicine? You see, um, I think medicine's quite different. Okay. Because after all, or bio, bio, Biosciences are generally different. On the one hand, they tend to rely on um, oodles and oodles of money because of expensive right. equipment. Right. You find that equipment, of course, you find it in the private sector. Well, but but well, but well, there are limits. There are limits to also what the in the nonprofit sector. I live around the corner from the Garvin Institute. Uh, they are now nominally affiliated with UNSW. They were previously nominally affiliated with University of Sydney. And that affiliation, the only reason they have it is so they can get access to ARC and HMRC grants by the <laughs> check the box affiliation. Yes, yes, but they yes, don't yes. get any major physical support from the university. Yeah. They go out and raise money. Yeah, on yes. the and, and, and the the linkage with university universities is becoming increasingly fraught, isn't it? Because the, I mean, I guess there, there are a number of uh, reasons for the um, decline of uh, universities in the Western world. And I guess we probably would want to talk about that at some stage. But before we do that, before we do that, listen, I want to raise one issue that's been close to my heart for a while, and I've written on it, it all got triggered by a, have you ever heard the name of Tyler Cohen? I think you have mentioned Tyler Cohen. Yeah. Refresh yeah. Name. Um, American, um, he's in the social sciences somewhere. He, I think he is a historian of research, but uh, don't, don't, don't uh, quote me on that. Um, Tyler, C O W E N. And about 20 years ago, he wrote The Great Stagnation, which is originally was just a, I think it was just an essay. And then he made it into a small, it, it was published as a Penguin uh, booklet. Economics and, professor at George Mason University. 
yep, yep, very much, very much a an academic. And he um, came up with this utterly shocking idea that in uh, physics, in, in all the natural sciences, and maybe even in medicine as a result, because medicine's downstream from the natural sciences, um, he came up with this terrible idea that we may have plucked most of the low-hanging fruit from the tree of knowledge. So, so this fundamental idea that the human brain is uh, capable of uh, grasping a limited number of facts, or you could say that the human brain is capable of a limited number of insights as regards the natural world. So maybe our brains are simply not built to perceive a fifth or sixth or seventh dimension or whatever it is. Okay. So, so, so this idea, and it really struck me um, that uh, we've been plucking apples and there may not be that many left, or they may be higher up the tree. And, and he illustrated that with, uh, in his, in his book, there's a graph showing the rate of innovation since the end of the dark ages, uh, so in, you know, a hundred year intervals or so, or, or less than that. And, and he graphs the major innovation over time. And I'll give you the spoiler from about 1970 onwards is steeply downhill, steeply downhill. And there's other, there's other, uh, um, there, there's some, some, academic work that shows that uh, when you when you look at uh, at the the impact of Nobel Prize winning discoveries in physics, for example, that's been going down since the 60s. And you, you uh, I remember talking to Alessandro Strumia, who is a, a professor of physics at uh, Pisa, I think in Italy, and he became world famous when he was at CERN in Geneva. And and got and ran afoul of uh, of revenge feminists after showing that even in physics women get promoted more quickly than men these days. <laughs> that made him very unpopular. He got kicked out of CERN where he had a visiting professorship, and then the University of Pisa told him either you shut up about this or you lose your your job here as well. So he did shut up. Uh, but then the STRUMIA, there's still quite a bit of residue on the internet on him. Uh, and and he had been involved in the discovery of the Higgs boson, which is what made his career. He's about, you know, he's uh, probably a little, he's a bit younger than you are, and he became internationally famous because of the Higgs boson. And that's serious science, not like you or me. Okay, that's real not science. Not like mine. <laughs> not like you or me. And the point is, point is, point is, um, I, I asked him why did he go into bibliometrics, which is, you know. Um, the one of the means by which we can measure research productivity, by the way. So bibliometrics is all about, you know, age factors and citations and, um, you know, uh, analysis of of a research output in the sense of publications. Um, and he said, uh, you know, at the at the at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider, um, we, you know, many, many billions of dollars or euros spent and and we had so little to show for it and it got less and less and many years and many, many billions of dollars and lots of publications, right. but no insights. Well, and purpose. this is why, this is why he got bored. He got bored with particle physics. The purpose of big, big physics these days is not to generate uh, understanding, it's to generate publications. Yes. That's, that's, that's right. Point. That's precisely, uh, that is the point I, he made. That's the point yeah. he made. And, and that is, and, and you need, this, this is coming at a very bad time. So there's this, uh, there's this idea that we may be reaching the limits of uh, the intellectual capabilities of our brain. Or sometimes, sometimes I would say maybe it's just, maybe there is an almighty being out there and he's laughing his head off. Okay. But, I'm going to answer that, but, but first I, I have to take some questions from chat. Uh, Anthony said uh, he understands publication index don't include books. Anthony, that is uh, some publication indexes like the ones used for the university rankings, uh, but the Google H index does include books. That yes, said, yes, a, a book is one publication, just like a 1,000 word comment is one publication. Katai says, as an undergrad student, I had difficulties getting access to statistical software like Stata and R from the university. 
Well, that's take that for what you will. Um, Anthony, <laughs> he says, all research involving sampling should have input from a proper statistician. And Anthony, I'm gonna next time I see you, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you who's proper. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, right. Gonna, that's right. After that's 35, after after 35 years, or yeah. is it 37 years in clinical research? Uh, uh, after 35 years of using stat software, after 380 published papers, and after reviewing thousands of papers for their, for, I think I understand numbers. Okay, I mean I don't have a I don't have a degree in biostatistics. But for God's sake, I understand numbers, which has recently become a major problem. Look, look, look. Because, because for those of us who understand numbers and probabilities, the, the, dis, the, the, the dislocation, the cognitive dissonance is unbearable now. I, I, may unbearable. Be a I may be only a sociologist, but I do have a master's in applied mathematics. And I am the author of uh, Methods of Quantitative Macrocomparative Research. And I no longer review articles using macrocomparative methods because I and other statisticians who are involved in that field have repeatedly pointed out that the field is riddled with type 1 error. People choose methods that simply produce significant yeah, results, right. but the methods are inappropriate. Yeah. We know these methods listen, just generate statistics. Listen, it's worse in medicine. And that's what makes the methods popular. Yeah, that's right. It's I, worse. I, I, I've literally told, told editors, it's not fair to have me review this article because this one article will get rejected and a dozen articles using the same techniques will be accepted. Yeah, that's right. I give up. So, um, I mean, I've, um, I've acted as an editor of a total of um, three or well, two journals and associate editor of one. And, and um, I, I felt that my role as an editor was, or as a referee actually, was mainly to stop the real crap. Um, and, and that also goes for mathematical uh, bullshit. And there is a lot of it out there. In some instances, I have a bit of a collection of papers that um, are mathematically impossible. <laughs> so, so I mean, I mean, there's so much. You know, there, there's the numbers literate, and there's the numbers illiterate, and the and of course that may change over time. I mean, I'm probably more literate than I was 20 years ago. But the problem is that the pressure to produce publications that is, there we are again, a measure of productivity that may do more harm than good. Well, what well, it means, what it means in particular now, where you 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 pay two thousand US dollars and you get published in some crappy obscure Hindawi journal or wherever, uh, so something online, um, it's just so there's so much wrong now. Look, and, before and, I answer your question, before I modestly answer your question to God, let me remind everyone listening, and there are there are a dozen people out there listening right now. Uh, we will take your questions if you put them in the chat window, so please do chat. Let me also plug my book, Australia's Universities, Can They Reform? Spoiler alert, the answer is no. no. Uh, but no. have a look at it, just published. And uh, I'm going to answer your question to God, which is that why do we see these declining research discoveries in existing fields? It's because those existing fields are getting played out. New fields are emerging. A few of them get traction in the universities. Data science got a place in the university. But there are lots of new fields that, well, university fields were set up in the early 20th century. Of course, early 20th century fields have reached well, maturity. Yes, in the social but, sciences, mm -hmm. we haven't had any new social sciences in the last 30, 40 years. Oh, in well, physics, in physics, Big Bang Theory, Leonard Hofstetter, who is the small guy that gets Penny, uh, at some stage says, but then really nothing new has come out of physics since the 1930s. Okay, so so this has reached public uh, popular culture. But listen, let's talk about other threats. So we've just established that in some fields, progress is getting progressively more difficult or even maybe impossible. Um, on the other hand, like, you know, the Chinese have just managed to keep an artificial sun going for a while. So so maybe ITER in, um, where's ITER? I think ITER is in France somewhere, just across from Geneva. I think yeah. maybe maybe they're going to actually do something useful. But there's there are a number of societal developments that make it much harder to get as far up the tree as we have to 
basically there's a whole lot of things that make the ladders that we use more unstable or more rickety or in some instances there's people shaking the ladders and the first issue here is the um the, the topic of complex systems and if anybody out there listening is interested in knowing what that means as a guy by the name of crawford holling who is a maybe he's dead by now he's an uh and a professor of biology a canadian that worked in florida uh and he he looked yeah yeah i i would i'd, I'd move to florida now if i was in Canada, I'd move to florida in an instant yeah yeah the keys the keys the keys okay never mind so so holling holling worked out he he was uh, into computers in the 70s and 80s okay when that was a big deal and and he was into cybernetics so he looked at he tried to produce mathematical models for complex systems like, a, you know, a, 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 a coral reef appropriate to Florida or an old growth forest appropriate more for Canada, maybe predator prey interactions in the tundra, that kind of thing. And what he found was that the more complex he made his systems, the more he let them mature, the more brittle they became, the less able to withstand sudden change. And the thing that should have netted him the Nobel Prize was the, the insight that the same rules applies to man-made systems. It applies to your own personal life. It applies to General Motors. It applies to the federal government of Australia. It applies to anything man-made out there. The more complex a system becomes, the, the longer it'll take to turn the super tanker around, okay? A small yacht can has, you know, you can turn it, uh, you know, back uh, back on its way within like, uh, you know, a minute or two. But the super tanker will take hours. And 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 we can see it everywhere. We can see it in, in, in medicine. We can see it in bioscience. We can see it in the universities, in the hospitals. The National Disability Insurance Scheme is a bureaucratic, it's a total disaster. The, uh, the broadband network, APRA, the NHMRC, the ARC, all these, oh, uh, the rural, the, 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 the rural fire, fire, what's it called? The rural fire service, yes. um, anything. And of course, universities, we all know, even militaries, uh, okay? The, the, the amount of infrastructure that's there to get an outcome is ever increasing. Absolutely. And, but, and, the, and what that means that, that, what that means really is that everything we build if left alone, if just left to develop, will turn into an unfixable bureaucratic nightmare. I agree. But the magic about postmodern American civilization is that there are always new institutional forms of rising to take the place of these dinosaurs that are inevitably going to die, or if not to die, to shrivel down and become lizards and pigeons. Ah. Yes, I very much hope so. Rising to take their place. I very much hope so. But in the meantime, these institutions do terrible harm. And and the the if anybody asks themselves why the response of Western societies to the COVID pandemic has been such an absolute utter multi-trillion dollar disaster, <laughs> you don't have to look any further. We have seen multiple systems failures and in some instances these systems failures are very very glaring like for example the tga or therapeutic goods administration mm -hmm. or in in my world i'm talking mainly about my but world i'm sorry peter the it is FDA, absolutely immoral the it is yeah, that absolutely <laughs> immoral to try to treat coronavirus you cannot treat it with any available drug unless it's a newly developed patentable drug Oh, un unless, 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 unless it's, a drug, it's a drug that makes the owner billions of bucks. Other than that, it's immoral to try it. Doctors so, but, should but you see, you see it. but a really important Don't point. Don't take aspirin, I, it's too cheap. And, yeah, and, and I think a lot of people um, see a conspiracy. You remember um, when they discovered aspirin could, could prevent heart disease? Yeah, that's and, right. And the problem well, it took was a while. Was, to, you and know, the problem it, was that it was too cheap. Yeah, it took right. a while. I remember the ISIS one trial, the ISIS two trial, the ISIS yeah, three or, trial. Or, 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 yeah, or that, that, that simple antibiotics could cure stomach ulcers. Too yeah. cheap, yeah. right? Too cheap to be used. Yep. So, so, but what it boils down to is that we're dealing with systems failures that are not the result of ill will, or mostly not. I mean, I don't know about Anthony Fauci, okay? I mean, he's a bloody liar. <laughs> but, but apart from that, mostly probably not ill will. 
mostly it's probably just the usual concoction of inertia, incompetence, yeah. and yes, and of course, and um, inability. I think inertia plays a large role. Inability to change tack, yeah. and the more complex a system is, the worse that gets. There's also a book by a guy called Thomas Homer Dixon, another Canadian, uh, who about 15 years ago wrote The Upside of Tao. Uh, and I was interested in that because I did read, wrote, write a piece for the MJA for the Medical Journal of Australia in about 09 or so, where I, I channeled him. Uh, uh, because there was, that was at a time when in New South Wales, there was the Garling Report, which is about reforming public health, which was obviously a problem, seen as a problem at the time. And the Garling Report did exactly what Homer Dixon um, stated. He stated, reform, I mean, you know, people realize something's wrong. We've got to reform our systems. And Homer Dixon says, reform usually adds another layer of complexity on top of an already cumbersome and dysfunctional man management system. And you could claim that modern IT makes that worse because because there's so much opportunity for micromanagement. The upside of down, by the way, the upside of down thing, what's the upside? I mean, what's the upside of down? Um, what's the upside of a bushfire, a global financial crisis, a corona pandemic? He points out that the only way to reform an excessively complex, brittle system is through catastrophe. Well, it's funny you should say that because Anthony in the chat has just mentioned Joseph Schumpeter and creative destruction as being oh, the answer of course, to yeah. your question. That's exactly right. Yeah, and, and the, the point just is I don't want to be in the middle of creative destruction when it happens <laughs> uh, because it's it, it may be quite unpleasant for a whole lot of people. Yeah. Um, so what we see now and, and what I wrote in the MJA in 09 or so, I said, uh, the, the, the public health, our public health system is a disaster waiting to happen and it doesn't matter much what gets us. I mean, is it going to be the, a, a next, the next global financial crisis that was after the GFC? Is it going to be a volcano exploding in, in, in Indonesia or is it going to be a pandemic? And my top, um, my top bet always was on a pandemic. And then we got this one, which is an absolute fizzer compared to what we expected. What I expected was something like Marburg or Ebola. Um, you know, not, or even the, or even the 1918 influenza pandemic or the Justinianian plague or something, Justinian's plague or the plague that happened in, uh, during the time of Marcus Aurelius, stuff like that, uh, which didn't happen at all. So, so now I'm asking myself, given that our systems have been shown to be so incompetent, so brittle when challenged in a rather minor way, I mean, you just look at the stock market. And you'll be able to see that this was not a major challenge okay so just imagine a real challenge and how on earth are our systems going to respond to that <laughs> hey i want to read you something uh this is from the conversation which is a university sponsored those who don't know university sponsored. oh i know i know uh, the I conversation know it, university oh, sponsored yeah. website and yeah. uh, I, I just love this i'd like to get your reaction this is from the editor uh, misha ketchel climate change deniers are dangerous they don't deserve a place on our site. That's right. At the conversation, I remember we've that recently, we've recently vowed to improve our climate coverage, and part of that means moderating comments with a similar degree of rigor. Once upon a time, we might have viewed climate skeptics as merely frustrating, uh, but now it's 2019, and we know better. Climate change deniers and those who shamelessly peddle pseudoscience misinformation are perpetuating ideas that will ultimately destroy the planet. As a yeah, publisher, yeah, yeah. give the name of voice on our site. Well, contributes to I've a had a yep. Public Listen. Business. Wait one more minute. That's why the editorial team is implementing a zero tolerance approach to moderating climate change deniers and skeptics. Not only will we be removing their comments, we'll be locking their accounts. That is, the conversation will not allow a conversation yep. about climate change. Yep. That's right. I remember that. It's about what six? Oh, well, it's a while ago. It's uh, but yeah, time yeah, time yeah. flies. I, I remember. Listen, I was I was. At, when it started, about 10 years ago or 12 years ago or so, I thought the, the conversation was a brilliant idea. Brilliant. And I was very much looking forward to using it because, I mean, I have, I have now almost 20,000 citations. So I reckon, I reckon I am a voice that should be heard on the conversation. And I tried three or four times. In the end, I gave up because it became clear that what they really wanted, you see, 
I've become, I, I've been deplatformed. I've become a problem because I have run a foul of natural childbirth activists. And while they're not as bad as trans activists, they are, they are serious. Okay. And, and they be, are able to recruit a fairly substantial spectrum of, uh, of uh, academic feminism. Now you um, should tell us what natural childbirth activists are. Well, there are people who think that birthing should be, you know, women should have their babies without medical interference. Okay. Um, and that's you not... Mean like, you mean like back when maternal mortality was 20 <laughs> Well, you know, listen, of course, of course, they listen, I'll play the devil's advocate and say... Um, um, there's a whole lot of stuff that has a major impact of, on, on, on uh, maternal mortality and perinatal mortality, that is the babies dying, uh, without medicine at all. I mean, you just basically hygiene and good nutrition, that kind of stuff. So that is true. However, um, maybe that's too technical, but I'll make it quick. The thing, is, the thing is, when I, when I was in discussions about natural childbirth um, and its pros and cons, um, and the avoidance of, you know, cesarean section and medical intervention in general. I said, it is peculiar that many people out there uh, think that they, they are able to have uh, a completely natural reproductive event when they've done everything over the last 20 years to sabotage natural reproduction. <laughs> I mean, do you do realize what I'm saying? No, so I don't. we do I not. Explain. I mean, reproduction has become massively unnatural, okay. and I'm all in favor of it, for God's sake. I mean, the pill was one of the greatest inventions in human history. But the point is that if somebody has her first baby at age 38, and she weighs 120 kilos, and the baby is four and a half kilos, weighs four and a half kilos when it eventually pops out. The likelihood of that being a natural, normal process is very, very low. And, and that is, you can't expect things to go naturally if you've sabotaged nature for so long. Um, and, and that is something that's made me very unpopular. Um, and, and also, I should say a bit, you may have heard of Peter Reed, Professor Falmer, ex-professor of physics at, at John, uh, JCU in Townsville. And I've, I've discussed these matters with him quite a few times by now. And in a way, he, he, was, he was a greenie. He were Birkenstocks like me. I mean, he was a, a vice president of the, um, of the Wilderness Society of North Queensland. I've be, I was, until 15, a member of green parties in three countries. And the Wilderness <laughs> Society and uh, Forest and Bird in New Zealand and the, what's it called, the, uh, ach, you know, the usual. I mean, uh, five, six, seven, all the way to Sea Shepherd, okay? I mean, five, six, seven different uh, different environmental activist organizations that I was a part of until um, it got too much, like with like for Michael Schellenberger, you know, um, Apocalypse Neighbor. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I mean, I'm not, of course, of that caliber, but uh, I have, I've had a similar um, uh, experience. And anyway, so like with Peter, Peter developed a methodology to to um, to uh, assess benthic sediment, that is the sediment of the ocean floor. And it's really hard to measure, or has been really hard to measure that because the machines all clog up, as you might imagine. And he developed, uh, as, a, as a physics professor, he developed equipment, instruments that could do that properly. And then he found, so, so just technology. So a, technolo a technological insight or development, which then made him uh, terminally unpopular with, uh, with the uh, green left side of politics because what he found was that the the reef the Great Barrier Reef is virtually entirely unaffected by by runoff uh, by sediment runoff from Queensland uh, from the salt from the, the the land of Queensland because uh, the, the the stuff um, you know the uh, the sediment gets virtually completely filtered out by the mangrove swamps that go all the way up and down the coast as we know I mean you've been there I've been there of course lots of mangroves lots of swamps. And they act like a filter so that the outer reef is completely unaffected even after a cyclone it's basically nothing there and that argued strongly against the main political um, um, uh, bone of contention in queensland for a long time which is land clearing by farmers which is the anathema which is anathema also anathema to the current uh, palacio government so so he made himself totally unpopular and that really started it all off. That put him in the crosshairs. Well, and in my case, hilarious. in my case, what, what, what put me in oh, the no, no. crosshairs? Stay on the reef for a minute. Yeah. What's, what's hilarious is that when UNICEF took Australia at its word, 
that the Great Barrier Reef was critically endangered and threatened to take it off the World Heritage List. <laughs> Australia protested. No, no, it's not endangered right now. It's you know. And, well, you may and, have heard you may have heard that that yeah. coral cover right now is better than it's been for decades. Look, I don't know if it is or isn't, but what, what I challenge people with these sort of questions, people who want the science, want the data, I say, you know, what if? Forget Peter Ridd for a minute. What if it turned out? What if it turned out that the Ridd that the, that the reef was growing more than ever, it was healthier than it had ever been, and actually farming in coal in Queensland were benefiting the reef. Oh dear, would, oh dear, that's a bit unlikely. <laughs> would, well, it, could, it could happen, right? It's within the realm of statistical possibility. Would you Low probability. now change your position, or would you still be against farming in coal? And or if the would you... Is you would still be against farming in yeah. coal, uh, don't or, bring the reef into it. it it's or, not relevant. Worse, Salvatore, would you, as the conversation of anybody else, would you censor those that claim such? Because uh, I'll just quote Karl Popper on this. The growth of knowledge depends entirely upon disagreement. And what the conversation was doing in that particular case that you described, and also in other cases, because I never managed to get my line into the conversation, it was always censored and blocked. And, and the, the other side gets lots, lots and lots and lots into the conversation. This is to shut down disagreement. That shuts down the growth of knowledge. That academia shuts down science and academia. The, the conversation is run as a quasi-academic organization, and academia is the worst of it. Those who look for freedom of expression in academia are looking in the wrong place. We have gatekeepers. I have found the major newspapers, and I mean, and some people love the, the Murdoch press, some people hate the Murdoch press, some people hate the ABC. I have found all three of the ABC the Sydney Morning Herald and the Australian, much more open to viewpoints that might contradict those of the producers and the hosts of the show than any academic forum. These are you know, people who genuinely want to see the world as it is and hear points of view. Now, you can't blame an editor at the ABC for believing that the science is all sealed on climate change because, after all, that's what the scientists are telling them, right? But as people, I have found they're generally open-minded. I know a lot of people listening will hate me saying that about the ABC. Now, I'm not saying they're perfectly open-minded, but much more so than academia. And I found that's true of all What, an, in, what of an indictment. Media. What an indictment. And I'm is. someone who writes regularly for the major media, and I would find it much easier to place an article that was critical of the editorial stance of the newspaper itself in an Australian newspaper that I would to place it in the conversation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So so the the revolution that is ongoing, we're, we're in the midst of a revolution. These are revolutionary times, I feel, I, I, I believe. And and the as as virtually always, revolutions tend to start with intellectuals and uh, and say just look at the 1960s, of course the the almost revolution of the late 60s uh, was very much a university thing. So we should not be too surprised that academia is amongst the first true victims. Well, both perpetrator and victim of this uh, of this revolution. But maybe, listen, let's talk a bit more about product, yeah. research productivity I, and about I, I, I the threats. 20 minutes ago about uh, talking about natural uh, childbirth. Do you want to finish uh, that? Oh, I'll, I'll just say that... Um, a lot more damage happens in childbirth than we were aware of and that's become um, accessible through technology and it was these ultrasound machines that allow you to see a baby face in 3D or 4D so a baby sticking out a tongue in utero some of you may have seen that Are you serious? yeah so so that is that's the result of a small uh, it's, it's actually a neat case this technology is a neat case in itself of um, there are several quirks in the several quirky facts in the development of that technology, which happened in a small company in Austria, and it was done by a company that started after the Second World War in producing equipment for fishermen. <laughs> so it's really it's a crazy story, uh, um, and eventually trying to find fish underwater. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, basically, what they did was they they developed uh, 
ultrasound machines for use in humans in the 70s. And then they stuck with the technology that everybody else thought was obsolete. So they, at some stage, that company looked like they were about to, they were bound to fail. They were obsolete. They were old fashioned. They were, you know, little guys in checkered flannel shirts in, 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 in rural <laughs> Austria. Okay. And then, and then somebody had a brilliant insight and combined that obsolete technology with something else. And bingo, there was the world's first practicable 3D ultrasound system. And, and I was, I was interested in that since about 1985. So I've been with it from the pretty much from the start. And, and what, what that new technology, uh, what's the word serendipitously has mm -hmm. enabled us to do is to diagnose um, the damage that happens to women's pelvic floors and childbirth. And there's an awful lot of that. And there's more now than there ever was. Uh, it's the perfect storm partly because of bigger babies, partly because of older mums, because the older you are, the stiffer your tissues are, the more likely they get damaged uh, when they get stretched, okay? The more likely they are, to use the correct term, to reach their elastic limit, okay? Um, and in addition to that, we have political factors that make things worse, because for the last 20 years, doctors have been told that they do too many cesareans, which means the, the key performance indicators in obstetrics have changed. In the past, it was morbidity and mortality. So you want to keep people alive or cure them of disease or whatever. Morbidity and mortality. And in obstetrics, over the last 20 years, increasingly, uh, the C-section rate, the cesarean section rate has become a key performance indicator. And that means we've done enormous damage. But largely due to replacing cesarean section with forceps, an instrument from the 18th century, that does enormous damage, more damage than ever before. In Right now, in, at, at major Sydney hospitals, there's more damage done to women, to the to women's pelvic floor in childbirth, than ever before in history. And that's I, just I, crazy. I made aware of this. I mean, yeah, it's just I totally mean, crazy. You know, it's, it's one thing if mothers are ideologically committed to having natural childbirth, and they're willing to accept damage to their own bodies in order to make that happen. It's another thing if doctors are being incentivized yep, that's right. to promote something that is not in the best interest of the patient. Which that's situation right. are we in here? Okay. Well, whenever you, whenever you, you, in, it's the same with COVID, isn't it? Whenever you encounter a discrepancy between objective fact or data that's available to you and reality or perceived reality out there whenever there is such a discrepancy you got to ask yourself why is that and and you know a, a one of the um standard words to use in that context is bias okay is it financial bias or is it publication bias or is it uh, funding bias or is it you know you trying to have a career by producing lots of papers or is it political bias is it um uh, the bias of the university that wants to attract funding or is it is it the bias that you're a white male rather than a black female or whatever you know loads and loads of different types of bias and there's lots of academic work on bias but in general if there is such a major discrepancy between observable fact reality and its perception or its description in a paper or in a newspaper then you look for bias and, 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 and in, in my world, I was deplatformed as a misogynist for pointing out and for developing means of diagnosing a really bad thing that happens in New South Wales many, many, many thousands of times every year. Probably a couple of thousand times every month in New South Wales. And can you be more specific? Or <laughs> oh, it's just... tear, basically tears. I mean, haven't you ever wondered? I mean, you, you know, you, you, you don't have children, so you have never seen one happen. But I mean, you know, baby seats are like that. And yeah. you do have a rough acquaintance with the opening they come through. So for God's sake, I mean, this is, it's shocking. And, and I remember when I first, you know, as a medical student, when I saw the first delivery, it, um, it beggared belief that this should happen without major damage to right. baby or mother. And okay. in actual fact, of course, we would not exist as a species if that was a major problem. But that's the natural world, Salvatore. That's the world where, you know, the first baby is born when the mom is 18 or 19 or 20 years of age. 
And the, of course, there are lots of places around the world where that's still the case. So one of my PhD students, when I still had PhD, when I was still allowed to have PhD students, that is pre-2018 or so, um, because my university sabotaged that as well at some stage. So pre-17, one of my PhD students um, we sent to Nepal to, uh, to examine 130 or so women there at, in Kathmandu, in the main women's hospital in, in, in Nepal, and look at the incidence of certain types of trauma because um, it was well known and in Australian ONG it is a standard thing you people go to Nepal to do uh, to do you know it's kind of this kind of surgical tool. Really Australians are going to Nepal to have babies? Oh yeah yeah well listen no 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 oh, no 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 misunderstanding oh. they go to Nepal to fix problems surgically okay so there is, this is this is a bit weird but it's 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 very much an Australian thing you have and to explain what's happening. Yes. Don't assume well, too much knowledge. What, what, what's going on? Well, um, you may, hmm, um, you may have at some stage heard that there was a famous, oh yeah, Catherine Hamlin, the Hamlin story. Um, so uh, a couple of uh, a man and a woman, a couple of uh, two, two um, a couple. Of whom both were this doesn't sound like proper english okay but they were both ong specialists in sydney in the 50s and i don't remember exactly why and how but they ended up in addis ababa um, um doing physio surgery for 40 or 50 years i actually met Catherine hamlin when she was 89 and she, she recently died um one of the greatest australians of all time uh, so her entire life she spent uh, in Ethiopia, trying to fix women who had the worst non-fatal kind of birth trauma, where where basically the birth results in breakdown of tissues, in necrosis, and then you end up with a hole where your bladder was, or where where the where the front wall of the vagina was, or a hole where the back wall of the vagina was, and you leak stool or urine forever. It's called fistula. And Catherine Hamlin and her husband, I think Reginald. Um, they made it their task to um, change that since the late 50s. So marvelous, marvelous woman. <laughs> and um, I mean, at age 89, she was, or was it 93? I don't remember. I, you know, I saw her operate or at least assist with operating in her theater in Addis. <laughs> that was in 2010 or so. Wonderful. At any rate, so, so that's the worst kind of thing that can happen. Um, and 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 there's there's other forms of trauma. They can affect the perineum. They can affect the the, the sphincter around the back passage. They can affect the pelvic floor proper. And we know that is, and so Australians have been going there to operate to help. Okay. And they've also been going to Nepal for I think probably the Edmund Hillary Australia New Zealand co connection with you okay. know ever since Everest. Um, and um, and so lots and lots of Australians have gone. Uh, to Nepal to operate prolapse. So they go there and for a fortnight they do nothing else. Um, and so we knew that there's a lot of prolapse in Nepal in youngish women. So that's why we sent uh, that PhD student there. And what she found was that in Nepal, the prevalence of major trauma, childbirth related trauma, is one tenth of what it is in Sydney. Wow. One tenth. So we are 10 times worse for damage to the muscle around the back passage, which is called the anal sphincter. And is that and because of the age of the mothers or the poor health of the mothers or the size of the babies? There's multiple issues, but the, the two, we've done some, you know, more sophisticated modeling and we've done, uh, you know, in what, 1100, 1400 women, we did prospective studies here at the RPA and at the PN. And the end result of that was that the, by far the strongest uh, determinants were age at first birth and forceps and age at birth births can, can going up you know basically since since the pill okay it's been going up and up and up right. and of course it's had a lot of very beneficial consequences for women in general um there's no doubt about that and it's also led to a um it's made it easier for society to mobilize talent that would have otherwise right, gone into childcare at so, age 25 or so. So, so, so there, there is something to be said for that in society. There's lots to be said for that in societal terms. So why However, was this controversial for you in Australia? Sorry? Why was this controversial for you and lead to 
Oh, you trauma. mean my focus on maternal birth trauma? Why that was controversial? Yeah, yeah. Because you said this led to you being... <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. The person who gets to talk about these things on the conversation is somebody called Hannah Dahlen, who is a professor of midwifery at Western uh, Sydney Uni. And uh, in 2006, before an audience of some 200 people at St. George's Hospital, she told me that research such as mine should not be done. This has been going on for a while, Salvatore. This is nothing new. We just I mean, shouldn't know these things because it's too exactly. dangerous to know. This them. is this is the woke. Exactly. This is the woke monster <laughs> starting to rear its ugly head, uh, even in 05. But of course, it was earlier than that. You just need to read Philip Roth, The Human Stain, and you realize it goes back beyond. It goes to the 90s. It goes beyond. We've had this problem in our society for a while, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. So I'm I'm a minor form of collateral damage and it's okay it's okay i'm old enough i've had my career uh, it's it, 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 it's it's much much worse for younger colleagues and that is what drives me up my tree mm. that it is now becoming so difficult for bright young people to do what they need to do to contribute to society and to humanity overall it's getting harder and harder to do that for a number of reasons of course, the you know the woke revolution is part of it, but let's get back to, if I may, after this uh, digression into um, the uh, nitty gritty of obstetrics, can we go back to the, the th threats to research productivity? Because that's of course you know what has killed my research unit, and what has made it for what was this, for example, you see this damage done, and you have to diagnose the damage, and then you want to treat it. And we're at the start of something that would have been like hip replacements, okay, or joint replacement in general, or artificial heart valves, stuff like that. I mean, maybe that sounds a bit arrogant, but I think it was in that order of things. And it wasn't just that the uni was never interested in it. It was that I've been actively sabotaged for at least the last 10 years. And in 2010 or 2014, we could still do things that would be impossible now. In terms of development not just of diagnostics i can still develop diagnostics right but treatment of course the next step you recognize something's going wrong and you want to fix it okay you work out how to replace a joint it took 35 years to get hip replacements right from the um, late 30s to 1973 or so, or so when the charnley a guy by the name of charnley in the uk came up with a with, with the right way of of doing a hip prosthesis okay and, and I thought we were on the same route. You know, you recognize the problem and then you start, you diagnose it. You got to have a proper diagnosis. You need to understand what's wrong once you, once you decide you'd want to actually cure people. You need to know what's wrong. <laughs> and and then, you, then it's a matter of technology, of, of uh, bioengineering, if you want. And I thought, okay, well, we realized that what, what happens there, I mean, it was not in the textbooks, uh, I, I understood the problem in 2002 or early 2003 and and that's where some of my most uh, impactful papers get started and um and we did the first actual repair of such damage in 06 and we started uh, we then work in the lab between f7 and 10 and then we started in, in theater in, in 10 11 and we had several um prospective intervention trials which were of course ethics approved and watertight um but this is all over this is uh, this is all yeah. dead. Is this it's Australia killed, then, it's been killed off. Is this we Australia? Were, we were, we were ten years ahead of the rest of the world. Could you, do the, could you move to the U.S. and do this research there, or is this is this a you know a global movement that has destroyed? I mean, no, 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 no. It's going to happen. Listen, it's going to happen in Malaysia, in Singapore, maybe in Geneva, maybe it's going to happen in Brazil. Who knows? But but the problem is. Um, I remember a Nobel Prize winner for chemistry saying some eight years ago or so, or 10 years ago, that he was so proud that he had never attracted public funding of any kind, not ever. Be because it, and he said, we never got any decent money. This is a Nobel Prize winner. He yeah. said, we never got any decent money because we were so far ahead. Uh, the people who were supposed to assess our research grants didn't understand the first thing about what we were trying to do. Right. And and that's the situation. Yeah, 
it sounds like blowing my own trumpet too much, but anybody can look it up on the web. I mean, on, on, on Ovid or on even on Google Scholar. Um, that's what we had. And, and it's, and, and the, 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 the threats, uh, or the, the, the factors that threaten research productivity in general, the factors that threaten the productivity of our universities as generators of insight are very much what has killed my particular research enterprise. And because I'm 58 and because I have almost 20,000 citations, it's okay. I've had a pretty, this, the way they, what they say in Australia, I've had a pretty good innings. All right. I'm not sure. What would, what would the Americans say? Had a good run. A good run. Yeah. So, so that's okay. But if I was 20 years younger, no chance. Okay. Let's talk about threats. We've talked about the issue of, well, potentially the issue of the law of diminishing returns and the fact that maybe there isn't that much there out there anymore. But if I was able with my virtually non-existent means to come up with something really cool, well, surely that there are such apples still on that tree elsewhere. Sure. Okay. There is the threat of, um, of complex systems so that we're all bound up in those complex systems, which are bureaucratic disasters. The second is that there are a number of societal trends that make that worse. And one of this increasing risk adversity. Um, the, the best book on that is probably Daniel Kahneman's um, Thinking Fast and Slow, which was published, I think, in, in 05. In 02, he got the Nobel Prize for Economics. This is a professor of psychology who, together with a friend of his, um, I think he, he was born in Israel and then worked in the US and his friend stayed in Israel, something like that. Anyway, this team came up with the realization, the insight that there is a fundamental problem with the wiring of our brains, or at least in lots of people, there's a fundamental problem with the wiring up there. And in the sense that it leads to a systematic overestimate of small risks. Mm -hmm. And now doesn't that hit the nail on the head when it comes to COVID? I mean, the over, okay. over, yeah, I was over reaction. Yeah, it's very crazy. So, so the, the an, an over emphasis and small risks uh, uh, on small risks, and that's called the precautionary principle, and to avoid those potential small risks, which has bugged nuclear power, which has right. bugged all kinds of other things in our lives. Okay, well, so and I was, I was very much. I was a greedy. I was a greedy. I understand it all. Anyway. A lot of this has to do with control because so yeah. think about nuclear power. Nuclear we'll, let's, power. we'll get to that. Let's wait, let's get to outside interference. But first, oh, okay. let's talk about risk adversity. Oh. So Kahneman says the precautionary principle is costly and when interpreted strictly can be paralyzing. We would not have airplanes, air conditioning, antibiotics, automobiles, chlorine, the measles, smallpox vaccines, cardiac catheters, open heart surgery, radio, refrigeration, and x-rays. We'd have next to nothing. We'd be, we'd be living in a medieval environment. Um, if, and, 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 and the thing, <laughs> yeah, well, let's see the, the I mean, the history, I, I would, uh, the history of science has always been a hobby of mine. Okay. Uh, so, and of course, particularly medicine. I mean, the guy who did the first cardiac catheters, who was incidentally uh, a professor at, at my university in Heidelberg, okay. Uh, what was his name? Furman or Fairman or something like that. It, he did the first cardiac catheter on himself. Okay. I mean, that wasn't, that was not risk averse because nobody knew what would happen if that thing floated around inside his heart. Okay. But so, and so on and so on, there are many such examples. Um, in, in fact, there's a local one, uh, Nikolai Petrovsky, who is a, a vaccinologist at Flinders in, in South Australia, in Adelaide. He has developed his own COVID vaccine. He's done lots of, lots of stuff right, internationally for 25 years and, and, and lots of different vaccines. Um, and interesting ones too, like for dengue, for example. Um, and he um, he was the, it's called Spicovax now, and it's before the TGA. And I seriously hope that the TGA is going to treat it. Um, okay, I've read an article, I think it was in Quadrant, that the, uh, the, the government support went to Queensland. That was a political yep. decision. Yep, yep, yep. And not to, not to Petrovsky. And, and yep. Petrovsky had to do crowdfunding yeah. To raise, I, I contributed. He had to raise the crowd, raise the money to submit to the TGA. So not 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 research funding, 
Really yeah, yeah. funding funding to get a hearing from crazy. our dysfunctional sick bureaucracy. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, never mind. So so Petrovsky tried his vaccine on himself first. Okay. So that's a standard thing in, in biomedicine and you know, good on him. Okay. But that is increasing risk aversity normally would would uh, involve a near shutdown of the research enterprise. And then comes, and there we go back to uh, Homer Dixon, the catastrophe. Because once the catastrophe happens, in this case, a pseudo catastrophe, all the rules go out the window. <laughs> so, and this is why we have this, this crazy paradoxical sick situation where everywhere else we have this massive risk adversity and we don't want a single case of COVID. And uh, I mean, like, you know, it's like it, well, I mean, do I need so, to say any more? With this all is, of these issues, capacity for control enters. So, but my ah, favorite, that is outside. Greatest, that, so the that is outside management maxim of all time is what gets measured gets done. Yes, with the good. often unspoken corollary that what can't be measured doesn't get done. And that's so, exactly why right. does nuclear power suffer from so much stigma? Well, because other forms of power, which have enormous costs, have diffuse costs. I mean, how many people have, has coal killed over the years through lung disease? <laughs> right. Well, right. so, we don't know, right? We can't so, pinpoint it. But we so, can pinpoint exactly every person who's ever been killed by a nuclear accident. So, so the, the distortion, the distortion that you see there, the outside interference that distorts, for example, research priorities, that is a feature of a planned economy. A planned economy leads to a distortion of research priorities. So, for example, um, the, in, news, in, in, in Australia, both the ARC and the NHMRC have, in the, in the life sciences, have strongly focused on and encouraged research into, um, in fact, the University of Sydney had like five core areas that we're all supposed to focus on. Um, you know, one is uh, cardiovascular morbidity, one is obesity and diabetes uh, or cancer. Right. And, and everything outside those areas is kind of um, Cinderella kind of stuff. So you don't... I know don't... more about it in my book, Australia's Universities, Can They Reform? Yes. And, and, and see, see, the point there is, and maybe we should make that clear. If research is done in fields where there's lots of money, that virtually guarantees a poor investment return. And that guarantees low productivity. Yeah. Because if you pour millions and millions of dollars into one area and everybody works in that one area, then the likelihood of getting bang for the buck goes down and down and down. And that means low productivity. So anything, it's like in business, any on principle, not that I'm against, not that I'm a you know West Wild West capitalist, but any interference with the market or with evolution or with the natural development of research priorities, any interference is yeah. likely to reduce productivity. I think this is axiomatic. Darwin understood that, and just go read his bit about the pigeons. Uh, but I want to get back to the, the measurability because, like, we, we talked about coronavirus, and we're probably going to have to take coronavirus tests to get on a flight for the rest of eternity. Why? I don't think so. I don't think because, so. Because, well, for one reason, the test exists. Right? So <laughs> why? Well, but if we didn't have the test, we wouldn't require. We would eventually drop the test, drop the restrictions. But the test exists, and because it, you know, when do you say now people with coronavirus can come to Australia? I mean. You can't come to Australia today without a negative PCR test, but there are 10,000 people minimum. I mean, there, there are probably 100,000 people in Australia right now with coronavirus. What does it matter if 10 more fly in with coronavirus? It, it makes absolutely no difference. Yeah, gaga, gaga, completely gaga. No, I have no, absolutely no respect. In Australia. All right, but I have lost all respect for our institutions. I'm but sorry. we're able to te detect it. A and that's the problem, right? If we couldn't detect it, so if we didn't have the test, yeah. we would be measuring coronavirus based on hospital admissions for, for chest pain. And that's what they did with the flu in, in 1918, 1919. All the statistics are not about flu, they're about pulmonary distress. Because that's all you had data for. That's well, nice, yeah. you know, now that and we And then, test, uh, Salvatore, you may be aware 
of the problems with PCR tests. No, I'm not. I, I did um, I did PCR in 2002. I had a neat little research project which led absolutely nowhere um, um, using PCR technology to detect um, this what's called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorph polymorphisms, which is a, a basically small mutations uh, in certain genes, uh, certain connected tissue genes. Um, we had the money, we had the equipment, and I worked at the what's now the Berghofer Institute. So this is top, this is top in, top top in Australia, um, and um, I learned that you got to be really careful with PCR because if you you see, um, basically, you um, you um, multiply um, fragments of DNA um, of genetic material, um, and and the the beauty of the thing, the 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 the, the first paper on on PCR is, I think, the top quoted paper in the biosciences. In the life sciences, uh, and uh, mind you, the guy didn't do much useful stuff afterwards, but but he certainly had a real hit with that. And and the the trick is to make uh, the replicate to 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 allow for, on principle, endless replication of small fragments of genetic material. And so, if I took a swab from your skin, and then used PCR for certain types of, you know, you have to detect the, of course, you need to know what you're looking for. But I, I'd be able to detect anything and everything from your skin, everything. Um, it's just a matter of amplifying enough. <laughs> because, because you end up with, um, you get false positives for anything. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the inventor of that technology suggested that one should limit um i think it's called the c or cr value or something the the the, 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 the cycle this the number of cycles that are performed by the machine mm -hmm. i think he said we should limit that to 28 or so because beyond that god knows what you're going to get <laughs> you're going to you know you get going to get something from a bit of dust in the air that could be anything you know you could you could probably um detect elephant dna from your skin okay uh, <laughs> so, so point is, um, the PCR tests has been used in a way that is, in my view, highly inappropriate. And now, now we've even got, finally we're going away from that because it's too much effort and because the cures are too long. <laughs> and what do they do now? They're using these these rapid antigen tests, and people do them at home, and then they know that they've been through it, and they've they've you know, like my son, he's he's last week, he's fine, okay, he had he had the sniffles, um, and his girlfriend too, and and uh, now. Is our government going to require this guy to continue to get vaccinated for the rest of his life? There's so much that makes no friggin' sense anymore. So I'm kind of happy to be semi-retired because do I want to be part of this? <laughs> well, it's Ming, God Ming almighty Chang. stuff up. <laughs> Ming, Ming Chang in the chat says, hooray for diversity in research. Anthony wants to know, have you noticed the impact of Price's Law on our productivity? Now, I've never heard of Price's Law. Apparently, Price's Law is that 50% of the work is done by the square root of the total number of people who participate in the field. Uh, so if there are 10,000 people working in an area, half the work is done by 100 of them. Uh, would you say Probably that's true. correct? Probably yeah. true. I guess, you see, there is, there is the issue that I mean, you know, it's it, this is a this is a, not something we need to discuss greatly. The number of uh, publications, the number of journals, the number of people who work in the academic enterprise has gone up enormously. Of course. And I think I've got somewhere I've actually looked at that um, uh, the growth of science, funding PhDs and publication count from 1960 to now is like um, gone up by a factor of. 50 or so I mean, crazy crazy and we all know that we all know that we, we all know that the, the the number of papers published in in our fields is ever increasing and and of course there's only so much and we've just discussed that the the true insights the true innovations are actually 
decreasing. So what do you think? I mean, on average, the probability of one particular paper showing yeah. you something that's seriously new has been going down all the time. So, I, of course, a large proportion of the people working in a field will um, not ever truly see, succeed. I, I take a different and more optimistic view of this. You are is, an optimist. I am. And, and I think things are always getting better. And, you know, we know, we know that most published results are wrong. All meta studies show that, you know, we have lots of good reasons why that should be true. Everyone loves type one error. You know, most of it's wrong. To me, the purpose of research is not to discover new things. I mean, that's a big myth. We all have what? to pretend. I we disagree. all have to pretend we're discovering new things. No. In the social sciences, no one ever discovers anything. We do. Um, but, okay, but- We do. I the did. Purpose, the purpose of research- I did. Uh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> The purpose of research is to develop the expertise of the researcher so that by having spent decades in research, Peter Dietz is now an extraordinary expert who I can come to for extraordinary insights. If they let you. If they let me. Uh, by the purpose of all the research I've done is it, it's made me a much more sophisticated intellectual. The actual results grain of salt. Who cares what I wrote in a paper in 2004? You know, even I don't care. Even I don't remember what I said. Okay. Um, but I can now tell you with much greater depth and insight what's going on in China or how to handle yeah. a crisis in the South China Sea. Yeah, yeah. Peter Dietz can tell you how to reduce maternal mortality in your hospital system. Not because of the paper you published. The paper you published went to developing your expertise not so much to establish, I mean, there are very few papers that are so persuasive that the papers have been published. And now, of course, we now know something new. Ah, but it you see, happens. of course, the, you know, the medico um, comes from a different angle. Okay. So, well, science is different from the humanities. So Salvatore, there is so much suffering out there. And um, I went into medicine to um, reduce suffering. Um, and there are some areas in medicine where we probably do more harm than good. So, of course, that happens. We cause suffering rather than reduce it. And I think COVID is a very, you know, what our public health authorities have done is a very good example. But on the other hand, I happen to know that what I have done or what I can do, if they let me, um, can make lives better and of course that also goes it's not just in the life sciences um to also say if somebody develops um if somebody comes up with um you know clean cold fusion um or god knows what there will be lots of negative consequences too of course <laughs> oh jesus christ but but there will also be um surely a net reduction in human suffering so so i would like to you know, for the intellectual, it's so easy to block out how much suffering there is. And and we it happens to me too. I have to at some every now and then when I do something, I really is when I ask myself, is this gonna make a difference? And of course, in many instances, probably not. <laughs> but but the the beauty of the life sciences is that at least on principle or at least when it comes to your motivation hopefully your motivation is not your bank account <laughs> um also you've got to watch your bank account in particular if you're a deep platform i can tell you it's um you know you've got to got to get get financial finance savvy <laughs> once you've uh, really upset the powers that be <laughs> and thank god i saw it coming i saw it coming for six or seven years I've been telling my unit for at least since 2015 that we will be liquidated. There's no doubt. It's the climate is getting worse and worse. It's any blind man can see that uh, we're on the way out. So anybody, and I would, I would suggest that to everybody out there who's listening, if you're in academia and if you work in an area that may at some stage be affected by external influences, um, whether they are um, bureaucratic or woke or discriminatory or whatever, you, you may find that your, your chosen um, area of expertise suddenly becomes a, um, 
you know, a no-go area. Um, and you need to be prepared for that. The more specialized you are, the more prepared you need to be because the generalist is going to find another niche, okay? But the more specialized you are, the smaller the labor market for what you do. And, and, the, and if you fall afoul of um, the authorities, um, if you cause a social media shitstorm, you may not be able to market your skills anymore. So that means you need passive income. And you must get rid of your debts because that's the worst thing. So you need to, you need to, you need to, to, to move towards a gr greater independence from structures. And in academia, for God's sake, we're so beholden. We are so dependent. Um, in the past, you could emigrate. You just, you know, go to the US, go to New Zealand, whatever. But now, where would you go? I know of an Australian astronomer a few years back who emigrated to China to a communist dictatorship. And he was he was interviewed. Why on earth did you do that? I mean, Australia. He he came from one of the group of seven universities in Australia. I won't say which one it was. <laughs> and um, and uh, it wasn't ours. <laughs> and um, he said, well, I've been in Shanghai or where it was now for two and a half years. And uh, you know what? When I was still in Australia, politics dominated everything at my uni. It was unbearable. And here in Shanghai, I have not had to cope with a single political question, a single political topic. Politics simply has not existed for me in Shanghai. That is just so depressing, <laughs> so depressing. As an American, uh, talking to visiting Chinese scholars at the University of Sydney, uh, I've characterized Australia for them as two-party China. <laughs> it's a uh, similar system, but with a competitive yeah, uh, I, sort of party. I, I, remember, I remember a visiting scholar, I think from India, yeah. or was it Yeah, from a third world country, maybe Iran. I don't remember. I've had 180 through my unit before they shut me down. Um, and, and she said, we know we were talking about politics, and I said, we're going to get shut down. It's inevitable because the, we are working against the zeitgeist. The, the zeitgeist is against what we do. And, and so the, the, the growth of social media, the power of social media means it takes one decent shitstorm and we're shut down. And that's exactly what happened. Anybody can read it up in The Spectator. Uh, the, the article is, the doctor won't see you now. It describes my situation quite well. Um, and, and, and she said, but this is a, this is a, this is a democracy. <laughs> This is a Western democracy. You have freedom of speech. Well, and my response to that is exactly it's a democracy and society shutting down academics it doesn't like is like it or not an aspect. Oh, Salvatore, we had, a, come on, the 80s, the, 80s, the 80s and 90s were really good. Uh, We've had it good. The noughties were pretty good, but yeah. things have been going downhill rather badly. Um, and I guess in terms of societal interference with what we do, we cannot very well argue against society forming us or forming our research priorities or informing our research priorities. It's a good thing. The problem is that it's not happening. What is informing and deforming the research enterprise and universities in our lives is the activity of radicals of revolutionary yeah. radicals that have a, an enormous amount of clout and they have a huge yeah. voice because of this yeah. new medium of yeah. social media. It's yeah. new. It's like book printing. It's like Gutenberg's Bible. It's yeah. a massive disruptor. We've been talking for an hour and a half. Can you spare a few more minutes to talk about that very issue? You mean the disruptive uh, nature of, yes. of, um, of, of um, social I've media? Talked. I've no, no, about the small group of activists, because I've talked to many colleagues at the university about the need for embeddedness. They, they, they all believe that they're Polanyans who believe in embedded institutions and you know, social embeddedness. And for yeah. them, social embeddedness means we listen to the opinions of a small group of people whom they agree with. So 
NGOs, you are revolutionary. A certain set of NGOs you are. Influence and a certain set of revolutionary should have influence. Yeah. So, well, what about small business people in your neighborhood? What about 65 year old grandmas? What about grandma? What about, oh no, they shouldn't have it. You know, what about people, uh, you know, in the in country towns? They shouldn't have influence, right? That's anathema. And I think, well, you know, if we really believe in being socially embedded institutions, you know what? Let's McDonald's have it. McDonald's franchisees, they're yeah, part yeah. of society, well, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, every, everyone's part of society, not just a small group of activists. When yes. I say society, what they really mean is a narrow stratum of political activists. And I would like to see much more of society. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the nature of activism today is distinct. It's very distinct. And to understand it, uh, the best book to read on that or the best voices to listen to are Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay, the you know cynical series. Uh, I, I very much recommend that. I've given it as a Christmas present now quite a few times. Cynical I'm series. I'm not close enough to uh, exchange presents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pity, isn't it? Yeah. So, so this, is about, this is about critical theory and how it arose in the 60s yeah. in France and how it's um, and there's a German contribution, I'm afraid, yeah. as well, with Herbert Marcuse and the Frankfurt School. So, so, in, and how this um, pernicious ideology has spread around the world and has made us all into victims and perpetrators and is splitting society into ever smaller groups is this idea of you being defined by your skin color or by your gender or by your sexual preferences, which is a horrid, which is a, it's, it is a, I mean, pernicious is not sufficiently strong a word. It's a toxic, it's an absolutely toxic ideology, which is destroying everything, everything. It, it's destroying surf life saving. It's destroying everything. Uh, and, and of course, it's been very destructive in the university environment. So you have a whole lot of people who have, and, and, and what goes with that is the shift from a, an honor culture. This is why, you know, this is less prevalent in East Asia and it's much less prevalent in, say, Russia or Indonesia or even Malaysia or in South Africa. So, so the, we have changed from, you're familiar with that concept, we've changed from an honor culture where the core job of the male is to defend, to defend his honor and the honor of his family or his social group or whatever we've we've moved towards a a um a society where oh in i should say in an honor culture it's the stiff upper lip okay it's the stiff upper lip of the british you 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 refuse to be made into a victim like during the london blitz for god's sake if modern societies underwent something like the london blitz i mean hitler would have won after three or three days but but the brits and one of you know my my favorite person of all time is Winston Churchill. Um, and the, that time in, in British politics between, you know, say what, early May 40 and, um, and then the, the end of the Battle of Britain, which is when it's um, uh, late September, October of that year, this time, one of the most glorious times in human history. And it would have, it is the, I, I've always been a bit Anglophile, uh, you know, for a German, that's not that unusual, and particularly in the North, also I'm from the South. And, um, and, and what I always admired most about the Brits was the, the stiff upper lip, the courage in adversity. And that is the epitome of, that is the, the essence of what happened during the Blitz. And it's true. It's not, it's not a legend. It is actually true. Yeah, I, I uh, do and, admire. And, and, I, I, and the thing is, and this is the this is honor culture, the refusal, the refusal to be made into a victim, and now we've got the exact opposite. I, I, Everybody I do, wants to be a victim. I do admire that, uh, and I am also an Anglophile, and I do admire that uh, classic uh, uh, British approach to the world. That said, I'm it's gone. With, it's I, gone. Well, but that said, I'm with Matthew Arnold on this, except against him, in that uh, that was always a an, an aristocratic 
aspect of society. I don't mourn its passing. And frankly, I, I think we, we American complainers, and we are a complaining society, <laughs> we American complainers, ultimately are making the world a better place by constantly complaining and not being satisfied. And while it may be ugly, you know, it may not be admirable, it may not be beautiful to see the process of how American civilization works, I remain absolutely confident that it works and it's going to continue to work. And you it, it may not have the nobility, yeah. but it gets results. You are an optimist. Okay. I am but an listen, optimist. Uh, listen I, you said that, that the stiff upper lip is, a, is an aristocratic thing. Uh, I think that's a misunderstanding. An aristocratic you, ideal. I'm not saying that aristocrats themselves have stiff upper lips. I think this is something that goes deeper. It's the honor culture, okay? So if you go to Somalia, if you go to tribal, you know, some of the world's worst places in the world, okay? Tribal Somalia in the 1990s or even in the noughties. I'm not sure what it's like now, but it was certainly a basket case then and it probably still is. That is the honor culture the es essential on our culture. Okay. And who wants to live in Somalia? Right, that's true. I'm not, <laughs> oh God, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. What I, what I was talking about was a shift. Uh -huh. And a shift in some ways to the better, in some ways to the worse. So the pill has has been a disruptor in many ways to the better, in, in some ways occasionally actually to the worse. Uh, for example, the, the increase in children born out of wedlock. Uh, or the, the the ease with which women can survive without being married to a What's partner. funny is we only needed the pill because men weren't willing to use condoms. Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> but, I mean, listen, the point is there's always ups and upsides and downsides. So you have a disrupt, disruptor, whether it's, uh, you know, the the movable type of Gutenberg or whether it's social media or TV or radio. And 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 I'm, I'm afraid we are... The, the, the rise of social media has... Uh, enhanced or amplified yeah. other changes that have had a number of negative impacts. And the, the demise of the honor culture and the rise of victimhood, of, of being rewarded for being a victim. This is partly the you know social welfare, this the welfare state, but it's lots of other things as well. Peter, and now the, the disruption the, the disruption of social media, this this, this disruptor has um, turbocharged um, the, the victimhood culture. And and this is, I mean, wokeness is all about not hurting the supposedly weak, isn't it? It's I have news for you. We're on social media right now, and it cuts both ways. No social media, no let's go Brandon. You know, the, the memification right. of the world, uh, which was originally a tool for both side of politics, becoming a tool for another side. It, the battle goes on. Look, I want to yeah. throw in a couple of comments because we have some absolutely dedicated viewers who've been with us for more than an hour and a half. Ming Chang says the one dimensional university is the problem. Anthony says modern universities seem to be teaching people the art of producing superficially credible arguments in support of totally untenable propositions. And, uh, <laughs> and nice there one. you go. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you want to comment on either. One dimensional university, I mean, how would you respond to that? Is that. Please explain. <laughs> I'm not talking about one dimensional universities, but I, I, I suspect it is that we. Uh, look, we, we are supposed to produce research outputs. No one cares if I produce a cure for cancer. Ah, they care yes. if I produce research outputs. Okay, I got an idea. Okay, uh, yeah, good, good. So, so what you're saying is how do... Okay, if you want to make a system better, you need the right key performance indicator. It's always like that. So if you select the wrong key performance indicator in business, your business goes bankrupt. If you select the wrong key performance indicator uh, in armed forces, you lose the next war. If you use the wrong key performance indicator in your personal life, uh, your marriage may founder or you may end up committing suicide or God knows what. So you've got to get your KPIs right. Okay. And that goes for universities as well. So yeah. what KPIs for I the university? On KPIs in Australia's <laughs> universities. Yeah. That's right. So, so, and that, that's, 
takes some serious thought. Okay. Now, let's go back to our original list. I had a list of performance indicators. Okay. So, abstracts, publications, citations, impact factor, age indices, higher degree completions, public recognition, social media impacts, which is called alt metrics, and grant success. Well, every single one of those has got weaknesses, and the most major weakness is in grant success, because grant success is an input, it's not an output. So, what kind of outputs would we want from an optimal, from, from a university that is well managed and that's working well, and that is a an asset for the society that it lives in rather than a liability which is what we currently have in many places so an asset how do you make it into an asset and i think it's actually not hard it's not hard we got to go back to um i think i may have mentioned to you at some stage neil ferguson's uh, you know the six killer apps of western civilization mm -hmm. and i mean it's a bit broader it's like you know private property it's medicine it's science that kind of stuff but in the book, it also becomes clear that, uh, I mean, there is the, the fundamental principle of, the, of, of private property, okay? And the, uh, you know, the, the, the foundations of Western capitalist uh, uh, economies, sure. But it all and always, always boils down to free speech. Mm. Because without free speech, it's nothing. So if a university is not prepared to uphold free speech and the freedom of a researcher to follow and develop their insights. If a university does not do that, it is a liability and not an asset. So if we want to make our universities into true assets, the very first thing is the absolute minimum is what came up in the French report. So universities have to subscribe to a stringent and strong and powerful and well-enforced code of uh, free speech. Um, that's the very first thing. So nobody, no university should tolerate a researcher being subjected to a social media shitstorm. And even, I mean, shitstorms happen. But then it is, the question is whether the university ignores that or whether they go along with it in, in, in well, that dreadful timidity, that terrible supine lack of courage we've seen. For example, I mean, one of the worst examples was uh, at Evergreen College in, uh, in Washington State with Brett Weinstein's and Heather Haying's uh, story where they were uh, basically forced out of their positions as professors of, bio of evolutionary biology by a, a BLM mob in 2017. So this kind of thing, if a university goes along with that, it should die. It has no right to live. It has no right to exist. We are better off with it gone because it's a liability. And now you tell me, of a thousand major universities in the Western world, how many of those are in that category now? Look, 1,000? Or 999. <laughs> Look, I, I have to say, for the record, uh, I have always thought the University of Sydney was exceptionally good on freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Um, now, freedom of speech does not mean you'll get funding no matter what you say. Uh, but everyone always asks me, Salvatore, how come you haven't been fired yet? Salvatore, do you get pressure? And the answer is no, never, never a problem. Now, will I get promoted? That's a different issue. Uh, but has my freedom of expression ever been curtailed? No. And ah, anyway. Salvatore, I have personal experience. Yeah. I have had PhD students rejected for reasons that, on, in my opinion, were grossly political. And I would bet my bottom dollar that there are a whole lot of colleagues who are aware ah. of such of such events. I, I have written in my book that the problem of, of uh, viewpoint diversity at universities like Sydney, it's not once you're hired can you say your mind, it's will you get hired in the first place. That's a whole different issue. Uh, but within the community itself, I've been very impressed with the universities. You are the an optimist. Expression. And you have been lucky to not work in gender studies, 
or in uh, oh but i've commented in the paper on gender I I just sure, 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 sure. Sure. But, but there are but surely we can agree that there are there is i could within five minutes i could produce a list of 20 topics that for which you will not be able to enroll a phd student absolutely no, I, I, absolutely. So there you are. No okay. Question. So so you know, listen. I, I'm I, I'm I'm also I'm also at heart an optimist. I, I really am. I mean, ask my wife. She thinks I'm way too optimistic. <laughs> but but the let's not. Maybe I should get her on. Let's this let's 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 not. <laughs> right. Oh, her hairdo is terrible right now. Better not. Um, you know, it's it's all frizzy because of the high humidity. It feels like Singapore here. Um, listen, um, we should not. Uh, Brett Weinstein, uh, who does the Dark Horse podcast, he's that guy from Liverpool who now lives in Portland, Pursing, and he has said um, he wonders whether it may already be lighter than we think. And I mean, for somebody living in Portland, Oregon, that's not that is that realization doesn't take a whole lot of brain power. We are to a degree we are protected from the worst excesses of revolutionary activity in the US. But we are God for God's sake, what's going to happen to us if the US? Um... Well, so first a quick shout out to Hilston, New South Wales population 1400. Thank you for watching. Um, and on that, I, I you know, everyone talks about diversity, equity and inclusion, which of course, you cannot apply for a job in the US and increasingly in Australia, but absolutely in the US without including a statement. But I prefer to call it diversity, inclusion and equity, the die <laughs> office, because once a university had become so committed to diversity, inclusion and equity, that I mean, literally, if, if you apply for a job as an assistant professor, you have to say how you have demonstrated a commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Yeah, it, I would not, I would not, I would withdraw my application. And, and, and while I'm in favor of diversity, inclusion, and equity, uh, it's e not stop, really stop. equity. Well, stop. Equity is, there's something terribly wrong with equity. And we could probably have a whole well, hour's conversation a whole show on, on that. that because there's something also inevitable. Look, the, the example I give people. University of Michigan Law School used to have no black students. It was based, it was in Detroit, had no black students because it admitted students based on LSAT scores and other criteria. And there just weren't African Americans who were doing well enough to get in. They had a, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. They tried to, you know, they tried to massage things in order to have black students. Then there was a lawsuit against it and they were prohibited from giving bonuses. But I asked people, regardless of the regardless of what scores people get, what, you know, you may have this ultimate commitment to only admission based on skill, based on achievement. You know what, in a democracy, you don't want a law school in Detroit that has no black students. And you would not, sure. even with set scores now, okay? But listen, well, listen you, Salvatore, 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 we've got to, we've got to be clear about that. And I'll, I'll come from first principles. Yeah. Um, another absolutely non-negotiable in my view core component of western civilization is come on liberty fraternity egality okay so egality and we've lost pretty much everything every one single one of those we've lost over the last two years at least i have maybe not everybody but the the, the egality concept which of course is is central to the french revolution it's central to the american Revolution or the, the Revolutionary War. This is about non-discrimination. And, and non-discrimination makes very good sense from a purely utilitarian point of view. You want, right. you want to maximize bang for the buck. Sounds if you right. employ somebody, you want to employ the person who is most capable of doing that job, who is best qualified, who's got the best preconditions for doing the job Sounds that right. they're supposed to do. And that is why. I, discrimination has always been bad for productivity. It's bad for productivity. It was never. For other purposes. Look, you, 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 Salvatore, 
Salvatore, it was never a good idea to hire somebody because of their gender or skin color or sexual preferences. Because what it does is, it's again, it's the matter of KPIs. It's the matter of key performance yeah. indicators. So if you, if you, you know, New, Year, New Year's resolution, Look, you rearrange your KPIs. That has consequences. And if I, you do it, 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 it it's, it's a zero sum game. So uh, if I, you, I, it's I like in a regression equation. I don't disagree with your analysis. What I am concerned is that diversity, inclusion, and equity have been made individual goals when, to my mind, they should be institutional goals. But but I don't come, on, think come on, come on, come I mean, on. Do you, do you want to say that, what was it called in, in, uh, in the US originally since the 70s? It's called affirmative action. Yes. Do you really think affirmative action has worked? Affirmative action Love is hell. unfortunately inevitable. Uh, I disagree. And the reason is I disagree. you just can't have, <laughs> you can't have a major university in Sydney, Australia, that has zero indigenous academic faculty. Do you so think we would have, do, I, how, that, I mean, that's, that, I'm sorry, Salvatore, that is a racist statement. It is. Because oh, what you're, because what you're you saying there, it. because what you're saying there is that yeah. there are too few indigenous or too few black or whatever out yeah. there to actually make it in our system or that they are institute, that they are habitually incapable of doing For so. That's many the reasons. racist, that is it, the racist it, core of affirmative no, action. It may just be they don't want to. I mean, look at, look at women, look at women in science. Okay, <laughs> mathematics departments are under pressure to get more women in. Now, forget the question of skills and distributions of mathematical aptitude. Forget all that. If you have a math department that has zero women, politically, in a democracy that's fifty percent female, that's just a bad look. So this is why. <laughs> so this is why you have to. So this you're saying. This is why you have to discriminate because women are too stupid to make it no. on their own. For God's no, no, sake! No, 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 no. Even if they don't. That is sexist. Mathematicians. And, and, and sexist, it's, Salvatore. It's, of course it's sexist. Even if women don't want to be mathematicians, politically speaking, you can't run a math department with no women. And so the department has to hire Salvatore, a woman. Salvatore, we have to agree to disagree because what you've expressed there is, um, I think it's pernicious. Oh, I it's think racist, this is, it's sexist, I think, it's bad for Yeah, absolutely, community. absolutely, absolutely. It is, it's just not necessary. Just it's just not necessary. Because, because what has happened, and I've got a graph here yeah. uh, produced by a, a, a gender scientist. I use the word scientist in inverted commas at the University of Sydney about um, a few years back. Let's hope I can still dig that up. And it was about the, the feminization of the university. Right. So that more and more every year, there's the, here it is. Okay, so um, data. Um, this is Department of Education and Training, full year award course completions, males, females. Uh, in 2016, 59.3% females and 40.7% males, domestic students by gender. Now, there's a massive gender gap. Yeah. And then there, this is from SAGE. You know what SAGE is at our yeah. uni? Professor and Renee Ryan put this slide up on the 14th of March 19. And it's about non STEM and STEM and how gender diverse we are. And it's like, you know, uh, academic grades A, B, C, D, E. And yeah. for everything, including the STEM, um, it is perfectly obvious that there's a wave of female, uh, f of women coming through the university. And if, the, if it was the other way around, we would be in a state of civil war. Absolutely. Um, so, so, but, uh, but we, we, are, we are seeing a, um, um, a, a resolution of the, um, disadvantage that women were under for a long time. But what we see now is a, a revenge um, overcorrection in that in, in some, in some, so for example, here, um, I mean, in, in, even in STEM um, yeah. faculties, uh, grades ABC now have a majority, a female majority. And that means that in five or ten years it'll be a female majority in level D, and in another and five to ten years it'll be a majority men, in level E. Men, and then, and, and, then and, and then you look at what happens to young. I have two sons, and then you look at what happens to uh, to young to boys yeah. uh, in primary school and high school, where systematically uh, male uh, traits are disadvantaged and discriminated against. So, so what is inevitable, Salvatore? What is inevitable is not equity. 
and it is it is not uh, um, you know quotas and whatnot. What is inevitable is a backlash, and that may take ten or twenty or thirty years. It may it may look like um, Donald Trump. It may look like the governor of California, uh, the governor of Florida. Yeah. God knows what it may yeah. look like. But there will be a backlash because now what's happening in academia as well is that an increasing number of individuals, male individuals, uh, experience discrimination. Look, uh, and and until listen, listen, but Salvatore, I've got to say this: I never understood. There's a whole lot of things I've I've learned lately, and I'm grateful for that. COVID has taught me how the Third Reich happened. I understand how the Third Reich happened. It's not a secret to me anymore. And maybe at some stage we want to talk about that, but not today. Not today. And, and another thing, and another thing I now understand, which I did not understand before, was um, the experience of the Black American. Right. And maybe it's helped helped a bit that I read all William Styron's major novels, including the, the Confessions of Nat Turner. And I've, um, I, I think. Styron is obsessed, and this is 60s, 70s, 80s, okay, 50s to 80s, and he's obsessed with um, with racial discrimination in the U.S. And he was right to be. I mean, he grew up in Virginia, in Norfolk, or or yeah, somewhere around there. Um, and um, I understand now. I understand how, and I understand how many women must have felt in academia, even as as long as 20 years ago. Um, I understand what discrimination feels like now, and I'm really, really glad that I experienced it at a time when I've had my run, my, my innings. Um, but so many, so many young men ex are experiencing serious discrimination. I know they do. Without, you, without only, having had a good innings. And I've those only, people, those people are going to be as I, angry as any BLM activist. I have long told men not to pursue a PhD in the social sciences because universities try to make up their gender quota in the social sciences because they can't make them up elsewhere. Lately, oh, they do. I'm sorry, lately, they do. Lately, I've been telling women not to study social sciences because you know what? It's no longer special to be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so unless well, you've got, and, unless you've got something, if you're if you're indigenous, if you are of a uh, underrepresented minority, if you're a member of a sexual minority, yeah, all right, you know maybe you can get a job in the social science. We're going. And, we're oh, going I'm not saying it's good. Don't you see? This is this sciences. is a, Salvatore. This is a fatal I, disease. Ah, and equity, equity, the idea of equity is I, a fatal disease. I think it is an unfortunate sign of a well-functioning society. But I know we'll have to disagree on oh! that. Look, we've been talking for two hours. We have, we have 10 people who've stayed with us this long. Thank you all every very much. Uh, time to wrap up, Peter. We've had a wonderful discussion. I mean, this is kind of, we've, um, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not common for me uh, to, uh, have something as wide ranging as this, and I enjoyed it enormously. Thanks very much for having me. All right, thanks for talking. Thanks everyone for watching. Really appreciated our first time out. Peter, you should be the guest every week. Uh, but no, no, I'll, I'll be in the audience next time. You have more important things to do, I'm sure, with your Friday afternoons. Uh, thanks everyone. Thanks for watching the first ever episode of the Professor's Podcast. We'll be back next week, I hope. And uh, you can see at least me then. Maybe you'll see Peter then if I can't get another guest. I'll be in the audience. I'll be in the audience. Okay. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.